Good morning, I'm Tyler Keeft alongside Ronnie Dahl, and this is the Oakland County Megacast on 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 WBFH, The Biff. In addition, today, as always, we are on Civic Center TV on Comcast, Channel 15 and AT&T, Channel 99, as well as Birmingham Area Municipal Access on those same exact channels. We're also online on civiccentertv.com and today we are on the Facebook page of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District via Facebook Live. Now see, I said I am alongside Ronnie Dahl today, uh, as always, but we're doing this a little bit differently. Ronnie is what we say on location today in the, bu in the business. I am of course at Green Media Center. Ronnie, where are you at right now? Right now? So Tyler, we are alongside one another virtually, just like everyone else is doing right now. That's a great thing about technology is we could take the show on the road, which is so great. I am actually up in Traverse City right now. My husband and I are up here celebrating our 10th anniversary, but our friends are also getting married up here uh, as well this weekend. So we're taking a little mini vacation and I have to say, Tyler, it is a bit chilly up here. We got out of the car yesterday and it was like, whoo, I think the high today is only gonna be in the 50s. So definitely feeling like fall up here in the Northern part of the state. I'm hoping to see some of the beautiful colors, uh, still a little green, but uh, as we get out into the uh, vineyards a little bit later today and tomorrow, I'm hoping to see some of the beautiful colors uh, up here in our beautiful state. We forget just how amazing the state of Michigan really is. It's incredible. It's like a different world up north, Tyler. Yeah, it really is. It's a, it's two different places that are in the same in the same general area, but it is almost like two different worlds. It's like two states within one state. So congratulations to you and Woody on your 10 year anniversary as well as to your friends on their upcoming wedding. So today, as always on the Oakland County Megacast, we are tasked with bringing you the latest news and information from all around the state of Michigan and in the U.S. and the world regarding COVID-19 and other top stories. And today on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, you can find our latest stories, including our top story today, businesses cited for COVID-19 violations. Michigan Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or MIOSHA, recently issued coronavirus citations to 19 different businesses for, quote, serious violations that could put workers in harm's way, the agency confirmed on Thursday. Citations were issued issued under MIOSHA's general duty clause, which requires employers to have a workplace that's, quote, free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to the employee, and closed quote. One of those citations came uh, carries a fine of up to $7,000. Among the types of businesses cited, a restaurant, a home improvement store, an auto repair shop, and construction sites among those that have been cited for these violations. And Ronnie, this is part of MIOSHA and, and other local health departments' recent efforts to ramp up enforcement of COVID-19 protocols all across the state as Michigan continues to be very aggressive in their battle against COVID-19. Yeah, the state is actually approaching this from several different areas, Tyler. We are now seeing not only MIOSHA getting involved, and they have been, they have cited businesses in the past, but you also have your local health departments, and the state recently announced that they are also going to be hiring ambassadors to go out and check on some of these businesses as well. And I think the ambassadors, they're basically going to be a front line and say, hey, you're not following the rules and regulations, let's try to educate you. And then if you don't continue to follow the rules and regulations, then that's when some of these other organizations are going to come behind them and start citing the businesses. Uh, when you do read this article too, you'll see that uh, some of the businesses, they, were, uh, they came from complaints, <clears throat> excuse me, they're customer driven complaints or employee driven complaints so it's a reminder to all businesses out there people are always watching do the right thing that indeed yes as the article said fines for those citations are up to seven thousand dollars a lot of money for uh, for people like you and i and 
for these businesses, especially these businesses that have been struggling to remain open over the course of the pandemic. So stay on top of your COVID-19 protocols and do so as best as possible. All the news making headlines today at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus travel ban to Canada for Americans has been extended. Americans won't be able to cross the border into the Great White North for at least another month as the country's government waits for COVID-19 pandemic to quote, be managed efficiently, and close quote, in the United States. Canada will keep the border with the United States closed to non-essential travel until at least October 21st. Border restrictions were first announced in March and have been extended monthly since then. Truck drivers transporting essential goods like food, healthcare professionals, along with other essential travelers, are still allowed to cross the border, but... Ronnie, uh, Canada continuing to show a, a vote of no confidence in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic on the American side, extending once again their travel ban on non-essential American uh, crossing of the border. You know, I was uh, talking with a friend yesterday, Tyler, and he actually has a condo in Canada and can't make it there because you can't cross the border. So there are a lot of people that are having a hard time with this order because they can't get back and forth. Just think you you have loved ones that are over the border. Uh, Canada gets a lot of visitors from uh, Michigan go, going over there as well to visit the vineyards there. That's not happening right now. So we're seeing this on both sides of, of the two countries. You can't cross into you know, for tourism on either side and then your loved ones. I feel so, so bad for so many of these people that uh, can't see their loved ones in person as this ban continues. And my guess is it's going to extend past October 21st as well. Yeah, I would believe that as well, as well Ronnie, especially, uh, especially affects people here in Michigan with a lot of family in, in Canada and uh, a lot of travel that happens between the Detroit border and the Canada border uh, by the Ambassador Bridge and the tunnel. The U.S.-Canada border at Detroit is the most heavily trafficked border in the country. All the stories at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Michigan could remain in COVID-19 state of emergency for months. Speaking during a Facebook Live discussion with small business leaders, Governor Gretchen Whitmer said Michigan could remain in the state of emergency for months, not years. Whitmer initiated the state of emergency on March 10th during the start of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. Since then, she has issued 170 executive orders, which do not require approval from the legislature. Frustration is growing among small business leaders who are calling the governor to be more transparent in her decision-making process as she continues to extend these emergency orders. Not just these small businesses, but people in the legislature and on on both sides of the aisle have even been making those arguments against Governor Gretchen Whitmer and, and she assuring uh, to small business leaders yesterday, earlier on this week, that she'll continue to extend the state of emergency for months out, but not years, Ronnie. Yeah, you know, and Tyler, I think one of the hard things about this for a small business is the governor is making these executive orders and she's saying she's doing so based on science and data, but she's not providing that data and that science. Now, back in the beginning, when the state was just starting to reopen, there seemed to be a lot more dialogue between the governor's office and some of the business leaders. Remember the hair salons, barber shops, they had a seat at the table to discuss some of these issues and how to reopen and how to reopen safely. But as this continues to drag on, some of the remaining small business owners are saying that they're not even open to dialogue at the governor's office. And that's one of the problems that they're having. Remember, movie theaters are still completely shut down. Restaurants are working uh, at a limited capacity. Well, now we're about to go into the winter months. How is that going to look for them? And so I think they just want to say, if you're going to continue this, then just be open with us. Let us know where you're getting that science and that data, because we're a part of this community too, and we all want to be safe. But if they have the information, they can make a better plan on how to move their business forward as well as how to budget for some of these issues as well. So maybe they can keep their doors open a little bit longer.
transparency definitely been a question that's been raised at the governor and, and at the governor's office throughout the pandemic as these decisions have been made. What is this science that you are refer referring to? And uh, people want to be able to see it to make a decision, an opinion for themselves based on the science as well. Wh whether or not that will happen, we'll see. Lastly, at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, high school football returns in Michigan. After much, much debate, high school football season has kicked off in Michigan, but with a lot of new restrictions, including who is allowed to attend. Governor Whitmer's executive order limits the number of spectators that attend games to two people per game participant. Football players, coaches, trainers, and fans will be required to wear facial coverings at all times. Concessions for outdoor sporting events are allowed under the MHSAA guidelines, but social distancing must, must be practiced. Digital tickets and cashless concession sales are also being encouraged by the MHSAA. Football games began yesterday in the state of Michigan. A whole slew of games. I actually, on uh, one of our family of stations on 88.1, the Biff last night was listening to their broadcast of their home opener against Rochester Adams, and it was a fantastic broadcast, and it seemed like it was a really good game. Football well underway in the state of Michigan, but still a lot of question marks, Ronnie, and even just yesterday, Lake Orion ended up having to cancel their first game of the year against Oxford due to a COVID-19 outbreak on their team. So these regulations that the MHSAA is suggesting becoming all that more serious for these teams as they try to play out this season and are already seeing a lot of challenges just in week one. You know, there is a lot of excitement though for not only the parents, the coaches, but especially the students to be able to get back to playing the sport that they love. But it does look a lot different this year than any other year and let's hope it never happens again that we have to go through this but it's like you said Tyler it's going to be interesting to see how long some of these schools will be able to continue to play because of the outbreaks I will say I think a lot of the students after they lost being able to play sports and now they have regained that privilege they are really starting to take this seriously because they don't want to lose playing again. So I think the students are going to possibly be a lot more responsible than maybe they would be if they weren't going to be playing the sport because it's so important to them. And uh, it's important to you too. You know, I think the great thing about this, as you said, it's going to be limited to just two people uh, per participant. So maybe the parents are going to be allowed in or maybe the grandparents are going to be allowed in. But that's why what you and Dave Scott are going to be doing for the Lakers is so important. Tyler, go ahead and pump yourself up and, and, and talk a little bit about your broadcast tonight. Yeah, we're going to be broadcasting live from Oak Park High School. Tonight's game is an early game. Normally, a lot most of West Bloomfield's games are at 7 o'clock p.m., but there are certain away opponents uh, for example, last year, Southfield a and and the year before that, similar to this season, Oak Park, that begin their home games at 6 o'clock p.m. So Dave Scott and I, around 5, 5.30 p.m. today, will begin our pregame coverage live from Oak Park High School. Now, they are social distancing over there, and they're doing a great job. Greg Carter, their athletic director and head coach of the football team, has done an excellent job organizing today's game. They're going to have some coverage there from other media outlets. They're going to have coaches and all of that in their press booth. So we're actually going to be broadcasting from the away stands tonight, uh, keeping our social distance from those that are visiting with participants from West Bloomfield High School, but doing whatever we can to bring you the broadcast in, in as best a way as we can under these circumstances. Definitely a very special season. And Ronnie, I think like you said, the players, especially after seeing news from this week with Novi High School shutting down their, their sports because of COVID-19 outbreaks, with Lake Orion having canceled their game against Oxford uh, that was scheduled to play, play tonight, I believe, due to COVID-19 outbreaks on Lake Orion's team. It shows that any given mistake in your approach to COVID-19 or any given misstep or just a happy accident could lead to games being shut down or possibly even your season. So I think players who have been so eager to get back on the gridiron or on the field or on the court, whatever sport they may be playing, are going to be taking these, these regulations and these precautions really, really seriously. Absolutely. And you know what, Tyler? 
for the administrators, they have put in so much time and effort and planning to try to make these events happen to get the schools reopened safely as well. And so let's go ahead and bring in our next guest. He's been waiting patiently here and it's always great to have Kenneth Gutman with us. He's the superintendent of Wald Lake Schools. Thank you for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you so much, Ronnie and Tyler. It's always great to be here and talk to the two of you. And uh, certainly these are interesting times. So it's nice to have a chance to uh, publicly talk about a lot of what's going on. So since we were just talking about high school sports, do you want to fill us in with what's going on over at Wald Lake? Absolutely. Well, so uh, uh, high school sports are happening. And so we're taking every precaution we can. We had three football games last night. We have our other sports, our fall sports going on. Two tickets per family. One must be an adult, obviously. Uh, we're, we're doing some of the ticket uh, cashless sales where we can, doing our best to keep everyone safe. So we've had our first home game, and we'll have a couple more home games coming up. Uh, and, you know, the, the news out of Lake Orion and the news out of Novi is a concern, obviously. And so we're watching that really carefully. We hope we can continue with the season, and we hope we can reopen our schools soon, too. So when, you're, when you do hear stories like what's happening at the other schools, what's the conversation with the students do they realize what is at stake here if they do test positive? I think they do. I think that, uh, you know, our students are well aware of what happens if they test positive. We've been very clear with everyone that, you know, obviously a positive test is going to shut down a football team. It's going to shut down a classroom. It's going to shut down a school or a district. Uh, so we want to be really careful with how we, uh, how we proceed both athletically and academically. Kenneth Gutman with us on the Oakland County Megacast today. He is the superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District joining us today on the broadcast. The Wald Lake Consolidated School District, of course, our Facebook partner on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. And we welcome all of you tuning in on the Wald Lake Consolidated School District's Facebook page. So, Ken, let's, let's t transition from sports to school. The school year is well underway. Wald Lake is in virtual learning uh, to begin the year for at least the first 10 weeks, as we've previously spoken about. So far, so good. How is that going? Well, so I don't know that I would fully say so far, so good. It, it, it's hit and miss. First of all, our teachers are doing a great job. Uh, our parents are doing a great job supporting their kids to the degree they can. Our administrators are, are also doing a wonderful job. But no one's going to pretend that online learning equals in-person instruction. There is no way they're equal. And so uh, it's going as well as I think we could have expected. There are glitches, there are internet outages, there are issues, uh, a little bit of Zoom bombing inappropriately that we've hopefully curbed to a greater extent. There's a lot that, uh, that we love and there's a lot that we don't love. And so as we move forward, we'd like to be able to give the option for some in-person instruction. And uh, we're, we're meeting with our Board of Education in a board workshop next Thursday night to talk about how we could potentially phase in some in-person instruction, maybe beginning with earlier, younger children and working our way up, doing it carefully and, and, uh, and in a measured way. But, and those who would want to keep their children home still, because we know that not everyone's comfortable sending their children back to school, uh, we would have an option for them as well. So nothing's been determined. I wanna be clear about that. We have a board workshop on the 24th and then a board meeting on the 1st where we will make some good decisions. So Ken, you mentioned Zoom bombing. That's the first time I've heard that term, but uh, maybe a blooper reel at the end of all of this could be in the works. Um, I know that a lot of school districts were having problems getting Chromebooks for all the students. Did Walt Lake provide those to the students and were you able to get a supply? How are you guys in that area? I'm happy to say our, our technology department was ahead of the curve on that. We got all of our Chromebooks in in plenty of time. We, uh, we got them out as quickly as we could, including holding all day uh, pickups for the Saturday and Sunday before school started. I had the, uh, the honor of being able to go in and spend some time with everyone as they were distributing Chromebooks on that uh, weekend. And wow, they were dedicated. They were working hard and they were getting everything out. So we got them in on time, we got them out on time, and uh, we were able to provide thousands of Chromebooks for students. That's amazing. The IT department really superheroes during all of this. For sure. 
when it comes to Chromebooks, or if a student has their his or her own computer, how does that work? Because even you know us as adults, like my husband has Microsoft, I had Mac. Some programs work on one, some flash drives work on another. Is is it an even platform? Is that a requirement that everyone has the same computer so everyone's on the same system? What's that doing? How's that working? So I'm not a tech guy, Ronnie, but I'll say this. I'm told that Zoom is tech is device agnostic and that it will work across Apple and uh, iOS platforms. And so, uh, no, there has not been a requirement that everyone have the same type of computer. There are districts that are what they call one-to-one -one, where they have a device for every student. We've not gone that way. We're a BYOD, bring your own device district. So we do have uh, we do have a wide variety of devices that we have available and that students choose to utilize on their own. Kenneth Gutman joining us on the program today. He is the superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. So, so can you talk about the bumps in the road along the way uh, so far as the virtual school year has begun? How are the teachers holding up? How are, how are this Wild Lakes educators doing? What are some of the needs that they have brought to the attention of the administration as they continue to also work through and, and innovate as this unique school year begins? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for using the word innovate too, Tyler, because there's nothing but innovation going on right now. None of us saw this. So you think back a year ago, we were doing uh, outstanding instruction in our classrooms as, as usual. Uh, our teachers are, um, I, I, I am in awe of what they're achieving in the classroom. Teaching's hard. Teaching's really hard, face-to-face, -face, in person every day. It is significantly more difficult online. The hours they're putting in, the, the sweat, tears, and let me emphasize the, the blood as well. They're, they're working so hard right now. Uh, they're, they're, they want to get back to in-person instruction to the degree they can, too, as long as we can keep them safe. And so uh, bumps in the road, look, you, you know, education is about relationships. It's about developing strong relationships with students and staff. In person, last year, it was easier to do online because uh, our staff had already established relationships with students. Well, starting the year remotely like this, you haven't established a relationship. So you're trying to establish a relationship on Zoom with so many students in your class. And while we're better instructionally in the fall, uh, it, it's a challenge to develop those relationships. My heart goes out to our teaching staff. They are so good at what they do. They're doing amazing right now. And unfortunately for, for a lot of people, it's to their own detriment. They're exhausted. Yeah, and, and Ken, I wonder about the relationships amongst the students as well, because they're kind of in the same boat. They were in their classrooms with their students last year when they got sent home. So they already had those relationships, but now they're starting the school year fresh, maybe with people they don't know. Is there anything being done to try to address like classroom to classroom, maybe breakout classes or, or something of that nature so that those students can come together? Because so many times you get that support from one another, not necessarily from the teacher. Yeah, we, that's a really good question. We do have breakout rooms within the class. A lot of them are breaking off into groups, doing some group work, and then doing some independent work, and then coming back to, uh, to, to screen time, which is still a little bit heavy. Uh, but, but it is a challenge to have those relationships. I mean, you think about the number of students who report that they come to school to see their friends, and education is a good byproduct of it. Uh, we, we know that, that it's a challenge to develop those relationships for kids as well. Ken Gutman joining us on the Oakland County Megacast uh, across the local area, also on the Facebook page of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District today. So, so Ken, let's talk about technology be, uh, more because there's so much that is being utilized by school districts, whether it be Google Classroom, whether it be Zoom, whether it be other software that's being used. Is Wald Lake sticking to one specific form? Are they sticking to multiple forms of technology and are there others that are maybe being considered as you communicate with other school districts throughout the local area throughout the state throughout the country and the world uh, to make maybe a more effective experience for teachers and students and families alike as they continue virtually thanks tyler we're currently a zoom district but we are transitioning to google meet very soon 
and uh, we're looking at, to do that at the beginning of October and uh, not not all in one day, but we're looking to do a transition at that point. Uh, but but that's the platform we've chosen to use at this point, and uh, we expect it to be a really smooth transition. We waited while they upgraded their program, and now uh, we look forward to moving to that. Ken Gutman with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, Superintendent, uh, you, you mentioned that you would like to look into and you're hoping to transition back into the classroom at some point in time, and even if it's a few students at a time. Is this something that could actually happen this semester or would it be next semester? You know, there's a rumor that I kept hearing and, and I get some emails from a few parents saying, why aren't you being transparent? We hear you're out until January. So let me address <clears throat> that, it's a really good question. We have not made a determination that we're out past October 30th. Nothing's been decided after October 30th. However, that's why we're meeting over the next couple of weeks. I think it is entirely feasible we can start phasing students in at the beginning of November with leaving an online option. So we have to determine a couple of things before we can make that happen. Whether we can, off we're currently offering both a synchronous and an asynchronous option on my path and an our path option. Can we offer both and still offer an in-person option? How do you restaff eight to 900 teachers over the next uh, several weeks to make that happen? There's a lot of work that has to happen behind the scenes. But to your question, Ronnie, yes, we could potentially have students phasing back in starting in November. Again, and, no, nothing's been decided. Right. Uh, so, and I'm sure that you'll communicate with the, the teachers, the staff, and the parents to let them know when that decision does come down. You guys have been great uh, with your transparency and your communication. I follow you on social media and I see a lot of your posts as well. So uh, talking a little bit about the teachers, I know going into this year, there was a concern that maybe there was going to be a shortage of teachers and definitely substitute teachers. How was your district on that side of the equation during this? Are you all set? We're staffed and we feel pretty good about it. We're fortunate in Wald Lake that we're kind of uh, uh, away from that whole shortage issue, although it's working its way in. We do see that in a lot of major cities across the country, the teacher shortage starts in an urban area and works out from there, as does the substitute shortage. Uh, we've been insulated from that. Uh, we still have a, a, an ability to attract a high quality candidates for all of our positions. And we still, uh, even though we know that time to time there have been some sub shortages that we've dealt with, it hasn't been as major of an issue as it has been in some, some urban and inner ring uh, uh, suburbs. Ken Gutman joining us. He is the superintendent of the Wild Lake Consolidated School District with us on the Oakland County Megacast today. Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 WBFH, the BIF. In addition, we are on the Facebook page of the Wild Lake Consolidated School District. And, and Ken, I'm looking down here at, uh, at the Facebook page as we're playing the live video and, and there are a lot of parents that are watching and, and are asking questions what is the school district's involvement in terms of parents uh in, and the, in the discussions regarding future plans for this semester including plans for p potential return in the future to in-person learning in some capacity or in in great capacity we love the involvement of our parents and welcome their questions and we hope that they'll send them to info at wlcsd.org so we have the opportunity to respond to them. I'd encourage our parents to continue to watch our board meetings. We're streaming them live on Vimeo. The information's uh, on our website. The information for the September 24th meeting should be on our website soon. We wanna make sure that everyone hears the discussion that's taking place, that we're able to address their issues. We, we value their input, whether they agree with what we're doing or don't agree, we do want to hear it. So we're really thankful for that. I know our original board meeting earlier in the year, uh, just prior to school, we ended up having a, I don't know, a couple thousand people watching. We had a couple hundred people watching the last one. We really want that involvement. We want them to know we, we are being as transparent as we can be. There's nothing to hide here. We want our kids back in school too. We also wanna make sure we have an option to keep everyone safe who wants to stay home. And we're working on that. We're, we're looking at the data from the CDC. We're getting better data now from the Oakland County Health Department. We wanna do everything we can to ensure that everyone is kept safe, that students and staff. Yeah, I think that's one of the benefits that's going to come out of this, the access to some of these meetings, uh, public meetings, you know, the school board meetings, because it is much easier to tune in 
if it is online from your home, you can jump in, jump out, and kind of do it by your schedule. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, talk a little bit about what happens when people test positive. At this point in time, it's not a matter of if, it's really a matter of when. What is the pro protocol there at uh, Wald Lake? Well, we're developing that currently. Actually, I just got an email this morning with some potential protocols that we're looking at, but we're also uh, relying heavily on the Oakland County Health Department. They're now doing weekly calls with all 28 Oakland County superintendents. We met with them last night. And we're trying to understand a little bit better about uh, what they expect as well. We're not medical professionals. I will give a shout out to Oakland County, who's provided three, uh, they provided three health nurses, uh, public health nurses to the Wald Lake schools for, for a period of time. And we're working closely with them as well to make sure that when someone tests positive, we have a protocol in place that protects everyone and is also transparent and we're able to communicate that effectively. Ken Gutman with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the superintendent of the Wild Lake Consolidated School District. So uh, flu season also coming up, uh, coming up in the next several weeks, several weeks it will begin and it will run through uh, the next several months over that. A lot of concern from the medical community regarding the flu and the COVID-19 continuing to be uh, in the mix together. Is that something that's also being discussed at the school district level with the Oakland County Health Department? And, and what maybe are your plans or, or your discussions, at least at this moment in time, in terms of curbing uh, those that double-headed monster, so to speak? We're all very concerned about that, Tyler. I, I, I don't know anyone who's not. I don't know that anyone who has the answer about how to deal with that, except that we'll continue to uh, remind our students, should they be in person or should they be virtual, to follow all best practices to keep themselves safe, wash their hands, keep distance from people. Uh, we're all worried about the confluence of, of the flu with COVID and uh, don't know what to expect with that, except that we'll do everything we can to keep people safe within our, within our means. Ken, just another couple of minutes with you. Anything else that you'd like to discuss today before we let you go? Sure, sure. Uh, what I'd like to just share with you is I feel very fortunate to work in a community that whether they agree or disagree with the district, are uh, involved, are vocal about their agreement or disagreement, and continue to fight for every child every day. Uh, we don't all have to agree on everything. We never will. But as long as we're all from uh, working from a point where we're looking out for our children, uh, we can have a healthy dialogue. And this, a lot of communities say that a lot of people across the world say they value schools. The Wild Lake Consolidated School District community values schools and values children, and we're really fortunate to be with them. Well, Ken, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ronnie. Appreciate having Thanks. you on. Ken Gutman, the superintendent of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we got a lot more to tackle on today's edition of the Megacast, including parks, police, municipal, municipal government, as well as eSports. That and more coming up. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this quick break. Michigan. We're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Park's COVID-19 Help Hotline. 
please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl. You're watching and listening to us on Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. We're also on the radio on 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 WBFH The Biff. In addition, today we're on the Facebook page of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. And we are pleased to be joined today, our second guest, uh, on today's show is going to be from West Bloomfield Park. She is one of their recreation programmers. Brittany Trout joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Brittany, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate having you on. How's uh, the team over at West Bloomfield Parks doing? We're doing good. I think like everyone else, um, it took a second to get into a groove and just adjusting and making the best with what we have. And I... I'm really happy with where we're at and what we've been providing for our community so far. Brittany, I know the West Bloomfield Parks has been a lifeline for so many people during this pandemic. You guys have been extremely busy, but just because the weather is going to be turning a bit cooler doesn't mean the fun's going away. You have a lot of things uh, planned for the fall. Tell us about them. Yeah, so just because the weather, like you said, is getting a little chilly doesn't mean we can't layer up. And our fall program and schedule is busy. A few of our programs we're offering are virtual along with in-person too to meet the COVID guidelines. So to run off some of those, one is camping in a bag. So you get to camp at home in your backyard. And we also provide some wonderful interactive programs to do. We also have our group hayrides, which take place at our Marsh Bank Park. And that one's just a little different. It is a group. So you're gonna pick your best bunch of 20 and you'll come to the park, enjoy a hayride and some good warm cider along with a snack. We also will have our park to treat to go. And that is now gonna take the place of our trick or treat trail, which I hope our residents, residents are super excited about. Um, we unfortunately won't be able to do trick or treat trail, but park to treat to go is going to have kiddos come to our recreation activity center. You'll be in your car, you'll check in, and then you'll be able to get out of your car in the parking spot behind you and show off your costume. And then the treats get to come to the kiddos. So we'll have a character parade and that will be supported with costume characters, local and non um, profit businesses around our area to come pass out treats. We also have our heroes appreciation too, and that's in November. So those are a few of our upcoming events you guys can keep a lookout for. So what's it like to be in a brainstorm session <laughs> to try to figure out how to revamp some of these programs? Um, it can be daunting at times, but it's actually fun we get into a groove of understanding our events each year back to back and you get to make those small adjustments. So now you get to come with a different mindset, a different challenge. And so as long as you have a good mindset, a good team with you, you'll be able to figure it out. And luckily here at West Bloomfield Parks, that's exactly what we have. Um, you'll have a programmer sit down and you'll run off some ideas. And we've taken our guidelines with what we feel comfortable with along with following the COVID-19 guidelines too, to make sure that we're protecting our community, but still offering some fun opportunities for people to still experience some recreation opportunities and get outside. And through that, it's still challenging, but honestly, it's a good little mix up compared to what we're always running. So I hope that answers that for you. And it's got to provide some inspiration, too, for, for in the future as you're planning these events now with COVID-19 in mind. You're trying to make them fun for a variety of people, families and just general people uh, as well. But does that provide any insight into things that you may be bringing into your regular programming schedule in the future as a result of what you've learned over the course of the pandemic? 
Yeah, I think some things we'll definitely take away is we can honestly roll with anything that we're given. I believe that this challenge right now was really hard because if you're taking a look at it, right, we have to somehow talk to our customers and participants and say, we want you to enjoy, but also please stay social distance away from others or if you come into contact. And so just making sure that we're able to communicate properly and that those who want to be at our events are also able to, it goes to show that the community does want events to happen and that they will support us as long as we're to making sure that we're safe and following the guidelines that need to happen. And usually our events are larger. So now to scale them back and have these stipulations, I think that makes us ready for maybe at some point if we are able to have larger crowds that will still have those stipulations and guidelines with us. And so it is preparing us for the future. Yeah, I think uh, going through this pandemic, we will never go into a large group setting the same without at least what, like 20 things of hand sanitizer with us and this, that, and the other. I think the good thing about the parks, you guys do have over 500 acres, so it does allow for you to be creative. But I wonder, what's the feedback been from some of the parents that are now being more involved with their kids? So instead of maybe handing them over to you and your staff, to explain things, parents are now taking your information virtually and trying to share it with their kids one-on-one. -on -one. Are you getting a positive feedback from some of the parents for that? Yeah, and I really want to thank our nature staff first off, because when we first came into this, we relied heavily on them and through our nature programs, which were virtually with the parents who typically came, they were ecstatic to still have something that was previously um, back before COVID-19. It was just a little different. And so they were able to either see the live animals, we were doing fun facts, and Lauren, Mrs. A was on along with our new two new nature staff to help really still be there for our crowd who typically wanted to be there. And then two, it also attracted new people and we did receive good feedback and just everyone being super grateful and that honestly kept us going and we just wanted to make sure that we were there for the community. Brittany, so Brittany, I'm sorry, uh, ahead, Tyler, man. do you want to go? Ahead? So Brittany, you, uh, you had mentioned about the hay rides, groups of 20, do you have to know your 20 people? How does that work? And do people need to register? Um, are there only so many dates and times available? Yeah, great question. So for the hay rides, there are certain dates. It would be October 14th, 15th, and the 16th. And you'll sign up for a time slot that runs between 4 to 7.30 and they're 30 minute increments. So between that um, time I said before, you can pick what time slot would work best for you. And so yes, because it's a group, setting it is up to you to pick the best of your bunch is what how i like to say it so it needs we would recommend that it should be people that you're comfortable with because you are on the hayride and you may not be able to sit six feet apart um we wanted to make sure that the person who is signing up or the family or the group that is signing up that they are comfortable if we are outside in a setting and we're not exactly six feet apart that I am comfortable sitting with my niece or nephew, my grandson, because we have been um, doing COVID-19 together. So it is up to the participants and who they feel comfortable with to bring on. And like I said, it is up to 20, but you could have less, you could do 15. And the price is different from what it's previously been, but when you break it down per person, it comes down to $5. So that was our math and thinking behind that. And again, we just want people to be comfortable and we still want to be able to offer these timeless opportunities during the fall that we typically have. We just have to do it in a little bit of a different way. And so that being said, that's why we have another day added on to hopefully accommodate for more people in the group. I think that's a great way to do it. Plus it allows for you to be with your, it's almost like your private hayride, right? With your group of your friends and your family. Yeah, absolutely. 
Brittany Trout with us. She is the recreation programmer over at West Bloomfield Parks. And, and Brittany, you talk a lot about the feedback you've gotten from families so far and, and from other people that have attended some of these virtual events and other in-person events during the pandemic. What are the people of West Bloomfield and surrounding areas that also engage with West Bloomfield Parks programming looking for during this time? And, and how is West Bloomfield Parks adjusting their programming and maybe even adding new programs to accommodate those needs and desires, albeit with COVID-19 in mind? Yeah, so for program wise, the way we've adjusted during this time is going virtual. And I really wanna give a shout out to the fact our Tai Chi instructor, she has now gone virtual. So our Tai Chi typically attracts our senior group. And as we all know, it's been tough for the senior group. They've been more restricted. And this was one way that we wanted to be able to help still be with our seniors here in our community. and. Tai Chi was one of the ways that we did that, along with offering other virtual classes. And upcoming soon, we are gonna add more free virtual items too. We'll have our senior newsletter go out at mid-October. It will be mail, but it will also be available online. So we have now shifted our thinking to online, but also we're still able to keep our in-person events we're just scaling them back and making sure that whether it's curbside pickup or it's coming to an event here that it is taking place outside and that participants do have a mask on them just in case you do come in close contact with either us the programmers running the event or if you're in contact with someone walking around if you're going to use the restroom that you can have your mask and keep yourself protected along with others so with that being said those are some of the ways we've adjusted, but now we've been able to kind of get into a new normal and set ourselves up for a fall that I think is gonna be really well off and it'll be a treat. We are able to offer and provide for all different areas. And I hope some, if you guys are interested, you would check out wbparks.org for our events, not only in person, but virtually, and then also some mix of other programming. You do have so many awesome events. Uh, Brittany, I have to wonder, are you doing the virtual events via Zoom? And if so, what was it like to try to teach some of the seniors how to use the program? Because I even remember when I first got on, I was a little confused and I've done some social media classes for seniors and like just trying to explain a hashtag <laughs> was a, it took a little bit of, of patience, you know? So I, what, how was that like to try to teach them to get on board with the technology? I can speak from my coworkers experience. I have unfortunately not experienced that myself. Um, our programmer here, Amy though, she was really in charge and led the way with helping with uh, what we like to call our tech issues. So when she was getting up and running our programs that were online, we had sat down and made a list of tips and tricks. So you had this list you could go in on Zoom and you would know if someone asked you a question, how to help with that. Also with coming up with a game plan too, um, asking your instructor can we do a test run before and it would be a quick maybe five minute test run to make sure that your audio your sound and the camera is working and so once the instructors were comfortable then they were able to reach out to participants and let them know and i do know that a couple of our instructors were able to help but amy we had a hotline basically if a participant was having trouble with zoom they would call our number and they would get to speak to Amy and Amy would help troubleshoot and explain to them how everything worked and answer any of their questions. So just like doing anything new, right? There's always gonna be that learning time and learning curve. And now that we're in a rhythm, um, we have had less tech support needed. So our seniors and our parents are all in a groove now and they know how to work it, how to mute themselves if their sound isn't working, along with our instructors are really ready for anything that Zoom could really throw their way. And 
now um, everyone too is also very understanding that there may be some lag time, something may pause, which is also always a great sense to know that our participants are understanding. And it comes back to just being happy that something is going on, something is being provided and that there may be a little glitch here and there, but nothing that we can't figure out. Brittany Trout with us. She is the recreation programmer over at West Bloomfield Parks, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And uh, Brittany, just a few more thing, just a few more minutes with you before we do let you go. You mentioned earlier the Heroes Appreciation uh, event that happens each year. Usually, it's an in-person breakfast. It's been at the Orchard Mall. We've we've done some uh, some coverage of it and even a live broadcast of it before. But this year, it's certainly going to be a little bit different. Can you give us any details? Uh, what this year's uh, event will be like. Yeah, this year's event is going to be virtually and also curbside. So there's two dates to recognize with this event. So the first day is for our veterans to sign up and they can receive a free meal and they'll want to register at WB Parks. But on November 6th, they will come um, curbside at the Recreation Activity Center to receive their free meal. And then we are going to ask everyone to tune in on November 11th because we'll have our lovely mega cast there and we will be providing a lovely zoom that will go over to appreciate some past veterans, other community members and really just show our appreciation for those. So this one is kind of a two, two for one. There's that meal for the veterans like we typically did it. It was at Orchard Lake Mall but now it will be enjoyed at their home. And then on the 11th is when we'll do our Zoom to show our appreciation. It is so awesome that you guys uh, continue to support the community and come up with new ways to show that support. You know, Brittany, I, I have a question. It's kind of a personal one, so you can answer or not answer. Okay. How did you get, uh, for people who are watching, you seem like you have a fun job. How did you get into it and what's your day to day like? Yeah, so I'll try and keep it short, but um, I, I originally, I went to college. Um, it was for something else, but now I'm here at the recreation. So I was able to find my way because I took my summer to do a sh summer job and then looking for my big girl job. I was just reading applications and once I read what the job entailed and I could tell from what the atmosphere and what the mission and goals was, it just lined up. It was something I wanted to do from my past experience um, in college. I was working with campus life and doing other things. So I always know that knew that I liked working with the community. And then I was just able to read the description. I applied and I really think to my interview when I came in, just the smiling faces and the, the way that they asked the questions it was still an interview but um i was still able to see like oh i would really like to work with them and talking about different scenarios too that just opened up like oh this is right this is good it is really fun and there is work but there's a good balance to both so i'm very appreciative that i'm here and also my co-workers and the community here are amazing well, we're lucky to have you here in West Bloomfield as part of the uh, West Bloomfield Parks Division. Such a great asset to all of us here in the community. And thank you for uh, doing all of the great things that you are doing as well. Before we let you go, is there anything we didn't ask you? As I, as I get personal with you, you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> anything we didn't ask you that uh, you wanna get out there? No, I just really want to say thank you all so much to everyone. And I hope that everyone, even though it is a tough time, that we can remember that there are opportunities out there for us. And if we work together, there's always something that we can do. And there is somewhat of a light we can find, whether we create it or we just go out to enjoy it. Well, Brittany, we thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. You too. Brittany Happy Trout. weekend. 
Brittany Trout from West Bloomfield Parks with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, we'll be speaking, uh, we'll be shifting from West Bloomfield over to Sylvan Lake. We'll speak with their chief of police, Brian Bassett, and get an update on the COVID-19 enforcement in the community as well as other local law enforcement information. That coming up and more, you are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. I'm Tyler Keefe in West Bloomfield with Ronnie Dahl on location in Traverse City. We will return after this quick break. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, Wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, We've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. I'm joined today, as always, by Ronnie Dahl. She is with us from Traverse City today on location as we bring you, as you bring, we bring you this Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Plenty of things making news in the community today, and we'll, we'll continue to bring you all of that and more throughout the show. Let's just take a quick moment, and I'll take you through some of the resources we have on our website on civiccentertv.com. Slash coronavirus. As always, we have the top stories of the day, including uh, today's stories about business citations due to COVID-19 violations, the travel ban to Canada has been extended, and information about the high school football season. Of course, Dave Scott and I tonight at 6 o'clock, we have the Oak Park Knights taking on the West Bloomfield Football Lakers. That is a 6 o'clock game. Our coverage begins right around 5.30. We will have that for you in its entirety here on Lakes FM. A big matchup between two powerhouse teams. Uh, Oak Park, one of the better teams in Division II football in the state of Michigan. And uh, West Bloomfield, of course, one of the top teams in the state from the OAA Red in Division I. Uh, lots of talent on the field tonight. Uh, Division I talent, Power 5 football conference talent that we're going to see, and we'll have that entire game for you. Again, 6 o'clock, Civic Center TV, WBLD, here on 89.3 FM, as well as on our website on civiccentertv.com. Let's go through today's top headlines, some of those top headlines. Business, businesses are cited for COVID-19 violations. The Michigan Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or MIOSHA, recently issued coronavirus citations to 19 different businesses for serious violations that could put workers in harm's way, the agency confirmed on Thursday. Citations were issued under MIOSHA's general duty clause, which requires employers to have workplaces free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to the employee. 
One of these citations carries a fine of up to $7,000. And among the types of businesses cited, restaurants, home improvement stores, auto repair shops, and construction sites. Just some of the many businesses that have so far been cited by Myosha for these violations. And Ronnie, businesses having to be more careful now as they have more eyes on them. And as the pandemic continues on, if they haven't taken those precautions seriously just yet, now really is the time, the best time for them to take those seriously as the state and its various agencies are really cracking down on making sure that these businesses are keeping the public safe from COVID-19. Yeah, and you know, it, I don't think it's just businesses. I think we've all become a little bit relaxed and some of the things that we are doing in relation to the pandemic. I know in the beginning, I was washing my hands like crazy, hand sanitizer, I was afraid to touch anything, I was wearing gloves. And as it goes on, we become a little bit more relaxed, but this is a big reminder to the businesses that maybe weren't cited because they had businesses from all different backgrounds so it's a reminder that hey you need to be playing by the rules some of these citations many of them were for uh no mask wearing um employees not wearing their mask or maybe not uh, you know socially distancing and some of the other ones were you know not having someone in charge of overseeing how you were going to handle COVID-19 within your business so it is a warning Tyler and a reminder to all the businesses, but also to us as well as citizens, when we go into public places or even our places of employment, because sometimes you do get relaxed if you're around your coworkers that you see each and every day, we've got to maintain these rules and regulations because if not, that fine is pretty hefty. And this is a hard time for businesses. They're already suffering their bottom line in so many cases. Yeah, not many businesses right now that could afford to drop $7,000 for these citations uh, because they're not doing their due diligence to keep the community safe from COVID-19. In addition, the travel ban to Canada for Americans has been extended. Americans will not be able to cross the border into Canada for at least another month as the country's government waits for the COVID-19 pandemic to be managed efficiently, as they say, by the United States of America. Canada will keep the border with the United States closed to non-essential travel until October 21st. Border restrictions were first announced in March and have been extended monthly since then. Truck drivers transporting essential goods such as food, healthcare professionals, along with as well as health professionals along with other essential travelers are still allowed to cross the border but uh, general travel and, and tourism and other travel to Canada still restricted from Americans as Canada does not believe that the U.S. has done enough to combat the coronavirus so they're keeping the borders closed. Ronnie this is no surprise they've been extending this month after month since March and it looks like they're going to continue to do that until this pandemic is mostly over with. Yeah I would imagine is it is going to be extended and it is hard as you mentioned not just for tourism, but there are so many people with their loved ones that live across the border that they've been unable to see them in person since the beginning of this. Yeah, definitely a, definitely a tough time for those who, with family in Canada who cannot cross the border into the United States and cannot cross the border from the U.S. into Canada. Lastly, on our website on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus high school football returns in Michigan after much debate. High school football has kicked off in the state with a lot of new restrictions, including who is allowed to attend the games in person. The governor's executive order limits the number of spectators that attend games to two people per game participant. Football players, coaches, trainers, and fans will be required to wear facial coverings at all times. Concessions for outdoor sporting events are allowed under the MHSAA guidelines, but social distancing must be practiced. Digital tickets and cashless concession sales are also being encouraged by the MHSAA as uh, these, these schools reopen to regular high school sporting events as much as, as they can be regular, uh, albeit with a lot of new rules to follow in order to keep themselves and their players and their families safe from COVID-19 and even when you do everything right Ronnie you can still be in a position where uh, your team could still come, come down with COVID-19 we've seen that being done 
Uh, we've seen that happen at many local schools recently, just in the last few days. Novi High School shut down their sports due to COVID-19 outbreaks. Yesterday, it was announced that Lake Orion would be canceling their game this week against Oxford due to a COVID-19 outbreak on their football team. So it's still very serious, and you, know, you can try to do everything right and still be doing and still slip up or still have COVID-19 get in there. So this is a very complicated football season, and that's why these regulations are in place. Yeah, I, I think testing is going to be key here because, and, and that is a good thing, testing is improving. Think where we were back in March and April with testing. So testing is improving. You have the rapid test, and it's also becoming much more accurate. And I think that is going to be the key to sports and it is also going to be interesting tyler what they're going to do with the big 10 when they start playing are they going to re, uh, are the players that are going to be required to wear a mask just like some of the high school students and keep in mind like when you're playing football or any sport and you're moving around a lot uh, the mask often will come off I mean, it does just when you're talking, a lot of times it will fall down and you're constantly having to pull it back up. So I'll be interested to see if the governor does change the order to allow the college students to go maskless, but they'll have their shield, but still require the high school students to keep their mask on. Yeah, that wouldn't be very surprising. Uh, it's a lot easier for college environments to lock themselves down, create a bubble system, so to speak, as best as is possible than it is at the high school level. All this is to be seen still. We'll see how all this works out and how it affects uh, football and other sports at all levels. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk to Brian Bassett, the chief, chief of police in the prettiest little city in Michigan, Sylvan Lake. That coming up and more. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. Ronnie and I will return with more after this break. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the, in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM and lakesfm.com. You're watching us on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, as well as listening to us on 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and 88.1 WBFH. Bloomfield Hills. We're pleased to be joined now by the Chief of Police in the city of Sylvan Lake, Brian Bassett, joining us once again here on the Oakland County Megacast. Chief Bassett, thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Appreciate having, having you on. How are you? How's the team over at the Sylvan Lake Police Department doing? Uh, no complaints. We're doing good. Um, you know, so far, everybody's healthy and safe. So uh, we're, 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 uh, we're doing really well here. So Chief, we're gonna jump right into it because a little bit of excitement there in the city of Sylvan Lake, but also this serves as a good reminder to all of us. Fill us in with the carjacking and the great 
response and teamwork that got the suspects in custody? Sure. Uh, so Tuesday morning, early morning, it was about 3 a.m. Um, there was an individual at our the mobile gas station on Telegraph. Uh, he was emptying some garbage out of his car, stepped away from his vehicle. Unfortunately, the vehicle was still running. While he did that, uh, two individuals, two suspects jumped into his vehicle and they began to pull off in his vehicle. Um, the driver of the vehicle then grabbed onto the driver's door and was banging on the window uh, and ended up being kind of dragged for a short period of time by the vehicle and was knocked to the ground as the suspects pulled away in the vehicle. He's so lucky he wasn't seriously injured because we've seen these cases where similar things have happened and uh, the, you know they've been seriously hurt. But we say it all the time, we hear it all the time, secure your vehicle when you get out, but yet we all do it. And I would imagine this happened in like a split second. It did, it did happen very quickly. Um, it, you know, it was a crime opportunity for the two, uh, you know, suspects who, who took the vehicle. Um, but, you know, to your point, uh, you have to be cautious, especially as we are, we're entering into winter here, you cannot leave your vehicle running unattended. Um, you know, it leads to these kind of issues and, and tragedies. And the second thing is, um, I'm great our driver wasn't hurt seriously, he had some minor abrasions, some cuts. Um, but, you know, we can, we can recover property, we can, you know, do some things after the fact, but if somebody's hurt, killed, injured, there's nothing I can do to, to fix that. So, you know, I, I, I would encourage people to, to not try and, you know, jump onto a vehicle, not try and do something like that. I, I just would hate to see someone, you know, get hurt seriously. And in this case, that, that didn't happen, and I'm grateful for that. So fill us in on how you were able to track down the two suspects. So, I, you know, first I want to thank uh, all of our partners and, and I'll thank our, our team here at Sylvan Lake um, from, you know, uh, the officer who initially responded to the scene, Officer Molinaro, and then our, our sergeant who came in and they worked together to quickly contact um, our partners at OnStar who activated and then began tracking the vehicle but then also our partners in the Oakland County Sheriff's Department and their auto theft task force. Um, they were very quick to offer assistance and they were instrumental in the eventual apprehension. Um, when we started tracking the vehicle, it actually tracked all the way out to the Kalamazoo area, uh, which is where with our partners out in the uh, Kalamazoo County Sheriff's, the suspects were eventually arrested. How old were they? Uh, they we had uh, two suspects. The driver was uh, juvenile. He was 15. And then we had a 17-year-old passenger. What were they even doing out at 3 a.m.? Yeah, oh, my gosh. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a great question, but I'll leave that to, for somebody else to answer. But, I, but, but my experience is uh, if you're out, uh, you're around that age and it's three in the morning, it's not going to be good. So it's why they were out. I, I don't know the exact answer, but, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it ended up, uh, ended up being great because we were able to make the arrest. Um, nobody was injured on, you know, the, the first part of it when the vehicle was actually stolen, but then also when the vehicle was actually recovered, nobody was injured. Um, you know, we got the property back in good condition. So the end of the day it was it was a, a good work by all parties including you know those parties that helped us out and the oakland county sheriffs and then also kalamazoo county sheriff so we really appreciate their help yeah my mama used to say nothing good happens after midnight yeah so well, your mom your mama's right <laughs> your mama's <laughs> right because it's true in my business it's very true right right so uh was he able to get his car back uh the, the uh, victim yes uh, he was, unfortunately, uh, we had to make a drive out there and so did he to recover the vehicle. So I, I don't know if he was planning on, uh, you know, spending some time on I-94 that day, but uh, they, they were able to get the vehicle back. Well, thank you to you and your team. But again, it's a good reminder to all of us because, uh, you know, like I said, it's in, it's in my backyard. Sylvan Lake is right around the corner, but we all do it. We stop at the gas station just yeah. quickly, throwing something out, putting air in your tire, and then boom, two seconds later, your, your car is gone. So 
great, a great work by you and your team, and thank you for all you do. No, I, like I said, it worked out great, and uh, you know, it's it's another just a, a nice to uh, all the all the individual parties stepping up and helping out, and it worked out well. Chief Brian Bassett with us from the Sylvan Lake Police Department joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast and, and talking about other uh, other things that happen pretty common, not, not often, but but commonly in our general area. We have a lot of we, we see a lot of incidents of vehicle break-ins and, and thefts from within vehicles or homes. What are some tips that you and, and other local police chiefs can provide to or are providing to local residents about securing their belongings and, and, and securing their, their assets such as their homes and their vehicles each and every day? Yeah, and, and kind of like you're saying, obviously we, we all know these things, they're common sense, but it's really just a matter of um, we're all busy, we all forget. Um, so it's just trying to reminder, we actually sent out, so we have, it's called you know the, the Sylvan Lake News Bite. We did the, exactly to your point, sent out just that those reminders to you know, make sure to remove valuables from the vehicle so that if you can see it, so can a thief. Um, make sure, and especially with all of these vehicles starting to go keyless, make sure to remove those keys from the vehicle. So, and, and again, it's one of these things that when you exit the vehicle very quickly, you may forget, but, you know, try and remember, keep them in your pocket, wherever it is, um, so that, that those keys aren't in there, somebody can't get in the vehicle and start the car. So lock that vehicle, remove the keys. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, as we're approaching colder months, you know, you can't leave a vehicle unattended while running. It's not only against the law, but it's just simply unsafe. It is a good reminder. And I will say I'm guilty of that so many days, especially with the key. It's it's easy to forget that it's, it's in the car. Yeah. Chief, you know, quick question. Are you, with so many people now working remotely, I would, were you seeing an uptick or a downtick in home burglaries because so many more people are at home? So we it, here in Sylvan Lake, we haven't seen uh, a change. Um, but when you go on a, on a more regional level, um, you actually have seen a slowdown. And probably to your point, there are more people home uh, some of those opportunities have been reduced. Um, so you've seen, and then, you know, businesses being, uh, you know, closed more often, uh, you know, some of the opportunities have been reduced. So I do, you have seen a, an overall downtick in the, the metropolitan area. Chief Brian Bassett with us from the Sylvan Lake Police Department joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast all throughout the local area as we continue to bring you the latest news and information regarding COVID-19. Uh, Chief Bass, just a few more minutes with, with us today on the show. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that's important for residents of Sylvan Lake or surrounding areas to know more information from the police department or any other topics that you would like to discuss today? You know, it's more of a general and, and to our residents here at Sylvan Lake, but also, you know, to the broader community. Um, we're constantly looking at what training our officers are receiving. And we're not, you know, these are things we've been looking at long before some of the current issues that are going on in our country. Um, but, you know, within the next 30 days, we're bringing in an individual who's an expert in autism training and making sure that our officers know how to interact with that community. Um, you know, and what I've done as chief is to make sure I'm looking at what runs are we actually taking? What uh, groups are we interacting with those with mental challenges, um, those who, you know, have uh, substance abuse issues and how can we best serve our entire community, but also the, you know, these populations that we're repeatedly dealing with um, to make sure that, you know, those outcomes are the best for everyone. So it's something that, you know, I, I, I take to heart and I don't, you know, some of these national uh, statements that are being made, but it's something we've been looking at for a long time and will continue to adjust how we do things and, and, you know, be there to serve the community. Well, Chief, we- So Chief, go ahead, uh, or quickly, let me just uh, piggyback and ask a quick question here. Does your department offer ride-alongs for the public and for civilians? Because I think a lot of it is we as civilians don't understand what police officers are faced with each and every day. Yeah, Ronnie, so the answer uh, is, is twofold. The answer is yes, but. Um, so the, the answer is yes, we have a policy and we, we encourage our residents to, because to your point, it's, it's tough to know 
what it is that a police officer does day to day unless you've had that opportunity. So we really would love uh, for our residents to do it. We encourage them to do it. Um, unfortunately, at this moment, we are not doing ride alongs only because of COVID. So I wish, I, I, you know, we'll, we're constantly reevaluating that. We'd love to get that program going again, but you know, it's such an intimate space inside of a vehicle. Um, it, it's difficult to do it right now, but again, it's certainly something that we have done and it's something that we will do in the future as we move through this crisis. Well, Chief, we thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Appreciate having you on. Chief Brian Bassett from the Sylvan Lake Police Department with us today. On the Oakland County Megacast, we thank him for joining us and providing us an update on what's going on over in Sylvan Lake and some important information so that you can keep uh, you can keep your belongings, your car, your, in your car, in your home, and all throughout your life safe and secure. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to transition from law enforcement and from the community to gaming. That coming up and more. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Ronnie and I will return with more after this break. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, Comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe in the studios of Civic Center TV at 89.3 Lakes FM. I'm joined by Ronnie Dahl today, as, as always. Today, of course, she is not in the studio with me. She is on location, as we say, in Traverse City. And uh, we are pleased to once again bring you today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast to, uh, to finish off this, what feels like a very long week for us over here. A lot going on. On our side, we have a lot to bring to you in the community, including, of course, our high school football broadcasts each and every Friday evening. Dave Scott and I will be joining you on the gridiron with the West Bloomfield Lakers. We're traveling tonight to Oak Park. That game at 6 o'clock. You'll be able to listen on 89.3 Lakes FM. If you're listening or watching one of our replays after the game, you can tune into all of our games, including next week's home game as well at, against Southfield a and as well as the rest of the season on 89.3 Lakes FM, Civic Center TV, and WB TV, the West Bloomfield School District's channel. So uh, from sports games going on, on on the football field and on courts in high schools all throughout southeastern Michigan and the state, we also have a lot of games going on in the virtual world. We're pleased to be joined by one of those people, one of the people that's making those competitions happen. Michael Salaka is the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel for Game Time and the Detroit Renegades eSports team. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Michael, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? Doing well. So tell us a little bit about Game Time and the Detroit Renegades for those who are not familiar with those two, with those two operations. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a really good idea to start with eSports. So eSports, for those viewers out there who are not too familiar, is uh, simply video games. Uh, and it's competitive video gaming. And at the Renegades, we are a professional eSports franchise. We've been around for five years now. We were founded in 2015. We are one of the top professional eSports organizations in the world. We compete in eight titles. 
including Valorant, Fortnite, Rocket League, Smite, iRacing, Call of Duty, and Super Smash Brothers at the highest level in tournaments globally. And Game Time is a facility, as you can see, in here in Auburn Hills, Michigan, directly across the street from where the Palace of Auburn Hills used to stand. Michael, when did you guys open? Well, we actually opened uh, just June of last year, just prior to COVID. And so, um, of course, uh, you know, who was anticipating that? And so we're slowly reopening to the public. I will say, I think eSports is growing in popularity. I know Oakland University is actually offering eSports as well. How do you explain to parents that this is a good thing to get into and it's okay for their kids to spend hours playing video games? It could pay off one day. Yeah, that's actually a great question. I'm glad you asked that, Ronnie. When I, I know my personal experience, when I grew up playing video games, my mom would always be on me, go outside, you know, you're wasting your time playing video games all day. However, um, in 2020, uh, esports is a viable career option. And actually, you mentioned Oakland University. They're actually the first university in the state of Michigan to have a varsity esports program and in fact, they are our official partner here and they train at our facility. So they're actually coming in at 5 p.m. today to train with their head coach and, and their athletes. And actually they've, all of their athletes have earned scholarships. So for those parents and, 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 and uh, viewers out there, um, it, it, it's a very viable career option. And what we're trying to do is develop a pipeline from elementary to high school to college to pros right here in our state of Michigan. And it's a very exciting time. So what are some of the careers in esports? Okay, absolutely. So um, it's, it actually mirrors traditional sports rather closely. And so um, as traditional sports has professional athletes, we have professional esports athletes. Right. And then from an organizational perspective, we have all the same, the similar function. So um, I serve as the COO. Right. Uh, we also have a CEO. We have a general manager. We have a scouting department. We have a marketing team. So um, it, it mimics traditional sports very closely and uh, the same career paths and opportunities in traditional sports exist within esports. And what we want to do is we want to share these opportunities with your viewers and with our community here in, in Michigan uh, and really encourage people to start taking a, a closer look because it's growing very rapidly, as you mentioned. So Michael uh, joining us, Michael Salaka, the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel for Game Time and the Detroit Renegades with us on the Oakland County Megacast. How has the pandemic affected esports? Has it encouraged more people to get into it? Are you seeing more athletes being more active? Are there more competitions now because people are looking for things to do? How has the pandemic changed the landscape of esports? That's a great question. Um, from a uh, high level competitive standpoint, it's really limited our ability to get our teams in a physical arena, which is where they traditionally compete at the largest stage globally. So um, we've competed in packed houses of 50,000 fans plus all across the globe. And so due to COVID, that's not happening anymore. And so those live events, which really bring, you know, think Big House, University of Michigan football, same type of, um, same type of sporting event, uh, those are not happening anymore. So it's, it's presented a challenge as to how that works. So there's been a shift towards digital tournaments. Um, and so that's one challenge that we've been trying to manage. And from a game time perspective, we've been really ramping up our digital tournaments. And so we, we've been hosting biweekly Rocket League tournaments. Um, actually, last Tuesday, we had 270 gamers from across the country compete in it for our $500 prize pool, and it was free to enter. So 
Um, for those who are out there who are interested, Rocket League is this game that's on the screen behind me. Uh, it's a very fun game. It's family friendly. Anybody can pick up a controller and participate. And our next tournament is coming up here in um, a couple weeks. It's going to be on, on uh, not this upcoming Tuesday, but the following. And you can find more information on our Instagram or our Twitter. We're game time underscore gaming. Okay, so Michael, let's just say I'm a, a 12 year old and I'm yeah. trying to explain to my parents that this is a good thing for me to do. I right. need to be playing these <laughs> games. What skills will these games and competing in these competitions build within kids? It's a great question, Ronnie, and thanks for asking that. What I find so intriguing about esports is that uh, the the skills that you develop are very similar to skills you develop playing traditional sports: um, teamwork, communication, sacrifice, discipline, focus. Uh, you learn how to win. You learn how to lose, and so all of these skills are transferable in in our careers and in our lives and in, in, you know, dealing with adversity. And so it's really a great opportunity to uh, meet others as well, uh, because maybe your, your teammate is somebody who you wouldn't m interact with uh, otherwise. And so it's, it's, it really opens up a, a ton of doors. And uh, my experience personally has been amazing. I've met so many people and, and we work with people across the globe every day. And so uh, it, it's, it's fantastic. And we really want to grow uh, the interest and the, and the awareness um, throughout, throughout the state. And so we, we really appreciate you guys reaching out to us for this opportunity. I will say I, I'm so fascinated with esports and where it's going. Yeah. Tell us about some of the training. Is it just like an athlete where you are getting up and, uh, you know, I think it's just we understand that arena. So, what is the training like for esports? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So, our pros, uh, they treat it as um, a Detroit Lions player treats his profession. So, we have nutritionists. We have coaches, we have uh, team managers for each team, and we're in constant communication with our pros, making sure that they have the proper equipment, uh, including the proper computers, the proper headsets, the proper mice, the proper keyboards, the proper monitors, to make sure that they're able to perform at the top level. And so what they're doing is they're training right now. Actually, this is one of our pros who's actually training live and you can see uh, actually his remote is hooked up to a software where the viewers can see which buttons they're pressing in real time. So the technology is, is out of this world and these pros are training the same way a professional basketball player or a football player is training. Michael Salaka with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the Chief Operating Officer and the General Counsel for Game Time and the Detroit Renegades. So we've talked a lot about the Detroit Renegades as an eSports team. We haven't talked a lot about what Game Time is. What is Game Time? Explain to people uh, what, what that is and how it relates to the Detroit Renegades. Absolutely. So Game Time is our... our facility here in Auburn Hills and it serves as our headquarters for Renegades and also it's open to the public. So what we have here is over 25 Alienware PCs hooked up with NVIDIA 2080 Ti graphics cards. We have Respawn gaming chairs. We have HyperX peripherals which you know for the gamers out there they know what language I'm speaking. Uh, these are the best, uh, best available equipment and technology on the market and we also in addition to we have a full service kitchen and bar uh, with a liquor license and an outdoor patio and it's a beautiful private event space uh, if people want to come and check us out and even rent it out and we're also in the process of reopening our kitchen and bar which will be open uh, here within the next two to four weeks of course under covid 
rules. So face masks are required for all public patrons, along with maintaining six feet of social distance. And we have hand sanitizing stations throughout our space. Michael, I have to say, I think this is the coolest thing. And I, but I have to ask, when it comes to the technology, you say you're providing you know, the best equipment, the best technology, it changes all the time. I'm a Mac person and I get so frustrated because it seems like every two or three years, you have to get new uh, new computers and new devices. What could be the cost associated with getting in or needing some of these computers and these programs to be able to play? Well, that's why we're here. And so what we do is we provide the opportunity for um, you know, somebody who, who's not able to afford a $2,000 computer and a thousand dollars in accessories to have access to that equipment and so our prices are very reasonable we charge uh, 10 bucks an hour and you can come and play uh, as long as you want we also have monthly membership packages uh, that you can learn about on our website gametimegg.com and so we provide the opportunity for gamers to get that pro experience but at an affordable rate Michael Salaka with us from Game Time and the Detroit Renegades. Joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Michael, just a few more minutes with you on the on the show today. For those that maybe would like to get involved with the Detroit Renegades, how do they how, how does someone get to the point where they're able to join an esports team? Is there anything they have to be able to do to qualify um, to try out for the team or to be able to, to join on? Well, in terms of uh, becoming a pro, if you're good enough, we'll probably find you uh, because you'll be winning tournaments and, and, and we our scouting department is scouring the internet for talent. Uh, in terms of uh, positions within our organization, uh, we are very open to um, uh, people sending us along their resume and, and, and experience. Um, the, the, if I had to say the pre, if there is a prerequisite, which there isn't, but there should be a genuine interest in esports or gaming, uh, if you, if you want to uh, potentially work with us, and the best contact for me to be reached at would be Michael at RenegadesPro.com. Hey, uh, Michael, before we let you go, uh, when we're talking about esports, where do you think? this industry is going to be in five years. <laughs> My is this the beginning? Like this is just kind of getting started and it, it's going to get bigger, do you think? Oh, it's already begun, Ronnie. It's already begun. They're building, uh, they already have a 100,000 square foot esports facility built in Texas. Uh, they're building 20,000 square feet uh, facilities all across the, the country. Um, and uh, this was happening prior to COVID and since COVID actually interest has peaked or it continues to grow exponentially. And uh, if you think about it logically, uh, it's because people are stuck at home, right? And kids are stuck at home and what are they gonna do? They're gonna pick up their Xbox controllers or pick up their PlayStation controllers and start playing video games. And so five years from now, um, I see esports uh, growing even bigger uh, than it is today. It's currently a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, in five years, it will be just as big, if not bigger than traditional sports uh, across the globe. Wow, I've been living under a rock. <laughs> well, hey, that's why I'm here. <laughs> hey, before, uh, before we let you go, since you're in a tech place, can you uh, give us a little quick look around? Uh, yeah, I can give you a 360 real quick. Yeah. So, this is our facility. Uh, as you can see, this is our bar here in the middle. Uh, we have our, our console wall over here for our Xboxes. We have over 20 TVs. We have three projectors. Um, over here is our stage that I'm, uh, I was sitting on. This is where we host uh, tournament matches for Oakland University. And then uh, upstairs is our offices so it's it's very very cool and we also have a patio um, outside that can host up to 150 patrons so anybody that wants to come by uh, we're actually hosting 
uh, this is the first time we've announced this. So right here, this is, a, this is an exclusive. On Saturday, October 3rd from 2 to 6 p.m., we're opening up to the public uh, and we're providing our, our offerings for free from 2 to 6 p.m. So uh, for all the viewers out there, if you guys uh, want to come check us out and, and get your feet wet with eSports, we'd love to have you come by and, and we'll have food and drinks for you guys. Everything's on the house. We just want to kind of share this, the sport and our passion for eSports with the rest of the community. Look at that, exclusive on Civic Center TV. We like that. Hey, Michael, what's your Instagram? I found you on Twitter, but uh, which Instagram is Renegades? At Renegades. Okay, okay. And then our game time is at game time underscore gaming on Twitter and Instagram. All right. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Well, we thank you very much for being with us today, Michael. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Michael Salaka with us from Game Time and the Detroit Renegades talking all about eSports. So again, in October, they will have uh, some, a free experience out at Game Time for you to enjoy, uh, enjoy all the great amenities they have at their facility in Auburn Hills. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be, we'll be shifting back to municipal news and information. We'll be speaking with the mayor of Rochester Hills, Brian Barnett. That coming up. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this break. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith with Ronnie Dahl. Today I'm in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM out of Green Media Center on Walnut Lake Road in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Ronnie is in Traverse City on location today broadcasting with us as she does each and every day, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon here on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. Today we're also joined uh, by the Wild Lake Consolidated School District on their Facebook page via Facebook Live. We appreciate Ken Gutman for joining us, their superintendent, earlier on in the program, and for all of you watching on Wild Lake Consolidated School District's Facebook page for being with us today on the program. Our last guest today is the mayor of Rochester Hills, Brian Barnett, who now joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. Mayor Barnett, thank you for being with us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. How, is, how are things going in Rochester Hills? Well, we're, we're blessed. I mean, obviously, this has been uh, the most challenging year uh, that we've seen in recent memory. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I think our, our people are resilient. Our business community has shown resiliency and people are ready to uh, to, to get back to some sense of normalcy. So uh, I, I'm optimistic. I think I think we're through the worst. And, uh, you know, the things that we seem to be seeing uh, all, all point to a more positive direction moving forward. But I'm looking forward to 2021, with no, no doubt. <laughs> Mayor, I think we all agree with you on that one as well. Going into the winter months, are you concerned for some of the businesses and restaurants that 
you know, without that additional foot traffic and not being allowed to be at full capacity, that it could hurt their bottom line and possibly even shut down? Yeah. Oh, that's a massive concern. Um, I mean, the small business community has been decimated this year. And, um, you know, it, there's a, a few things that have helped. I mean, there's been some federal government support um, and that needs to continue uh, if we're going to keep sort of Main Street humming. Um, but, uh, you know, you're right, the change of seasons means that so many folks are relying on outdoor seating uh, and the extra capacity, like in a city like Rochester, as we changed all of our ordinances to allow for more flexibility and, and ultimately much more outdoor seating. That really goes away. You know, you're not going to eat a burger in the 21 degree weather uh, you know, for lunch. So um, we've got to find ways to continue to protect our people. But um, ways that we can get more folks through higher capacities in restaurants. The numbers have been good lately. So I'm hopeful that uh, those uh, those metrics will continue to allow us to support small businesses because they're certainly going to need it. The, the road is not over yet for them. Mayor Brian Barnett with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the mayor of Rochester Hills. What, what sort of things are being discussed at the city level in terms of providing that support to these businesses as we're getting close to those colder months earlier on in the the pandemic as businesses particularly restaurants and retail were starting to reopen we saw a lot of municipalities uh, provide expanded space outside whether it be on city streets that were then closed down or or sidewalks to allow them to expand outside is there any, any discussion of what can be done from the city level to potentially help these businesses in the colder months yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that's been interesting through a process like this is, is, is you know, you sort of learn along the way. Uh, no one opens up the playbook and says, you know, how to deal with a pandemic month five or month six. Uh, so, you know, you're kind of walking through this together. Um, one of the things, as you mentioned, we immediately changed the outdoor seating uh, capacities. We allowed liquor to be served outside. When normally that wouldn't be the case. We uh, changed almost almost eliminated all the sign ordinances. Um, because we know signage and messaging is really important. A lot of times it's changing. So we used to only allow a small amount of signage. Now uh, it's, it's wide open through the end of the year. Again, just trying to show support. Um, I think there'll probably be some new ways and some things that we can do. Um, you know, some businesses are talking about some uh, unique hours that we may be able to, to assist them with. And, and again, trying to find more functionality uh, within their, their four walls. Um, you know, it's been interesting. Some people have uh, removed tables and reconfigured and and we've talked a lot about restaurants, but a lot of businesses are just looking at their business model right now, trying to reinvent themselves so that they can make it through this season to hopefully uh, weather this current storm. And in, in the times of crisis, we also, we have to reinvent ourselves. What do you think the city of Rochester Hills has done to reinvent itself that may be a long-term positive for your community? Um, well, listen, I mean, you have to, in my role, you have to find ways to um, to try to find the positive. I mean, you know, some of those things, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, work that doesn't, that they can't stop. We still have to provide water and, and police protection and, and and dog licenses when people need them. And, and, and if there's a water main break or a fire, we still have to respond. So, you know, we have lots of interactions with the community that we have to, um, uh, that we have to continue providing. And so, one of those, um, you know, one of those ways you have to do is find find ways to do that virtually. Find ways to for people to communicate and and, and conduct business virtually. We started doing virtual home inspections, um, so that uh, you know we had never done that before. But essentially, sometimes people on their cell phones going, you know, here's the kitchen remodel we're talking about, and, and our team on our side would say, okay, now show me the connection up there. And they show, okay, now show me the connection down here. Okay, now can you go around the side and can we take a picture of that? And so without entering a COVID, potential COVID environment uh, for our, our building inspectors or inviting folks in from a home inspection standpoint, we're able to conduct home, many of our home inspections uh, from the comfort of a cell phone uh, from a remote location. So, you know, that's something that we never imagined we could do. Um, you know, and there's, I think there's a lot of examples like that because cities, municipalities have to continue to deliver services. People expect that, but uh, we're, we've reinvented uh, uh, and updated our website. We're launching that this week. Um, we've got lots of things that we've learned along the way that we're trying to uh, uh, to, to, to keep because they'll, they'll make us better and more efficient uh, for the long run. Yeah, because I would imagine in something such as that, you're saving time for the employee not to have to drive to the location to schedule the, the appointment, being able to do it uh, over a cell phone 
definitely is so much more efficient with their time. And talking about employees, what is your budget looking like right now? Yeah, that's a good time for that question. Um, we, my budget goes up before the city council for a final vote on Monday. It's about $160 million. Um, when you're talking more about the budget, you're, you, you sort of look at uh, a couple key uh, factors, a couple key areas of potential weakness. Uh, for us, if you look at when COVID hit in, in mid-March, uh, we recognize that potentially up to a third of our budget was at risk, a third. Uh, and that third comes from uh, the loss of revenue from sport field rentals to building permits going away to state shared revenue to Act 51 gas tax money. Now, the initial revenue losses are still going to be pretty significant for the city. Fortunately, the most recent information suggests that the state shared revenue is going to be just about made whole. Um, Act 51, how many miles people are driving is down a little bit, but it's recovered quickly. So I think, you know, if you were to ask me this question on April 1st, i have been very dire. You know, I would have said a third of our budget, 32% of our budget is at significant risk. Today, uh, you know, I think probably if we come in somewhere around 5 to 7% under where we were before, uh, that's, that's fairly reasonable. A city like ours has been very conservatively managed. We can handle that. We have fund balance reserves that should uh, get us through. Uh, to, uh, to more robust times, but there are communities that are going to be in much worse shape than, than ours, um, those that live much closer to the, to the margins. And uh, thankfully, uh, it appears as if the, uh, the economy has rebounded uh, in a way that was quicker than most people's worst case projections. Mayor Brian Barnett with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the mayor of Rochester Hills, joining us today on the, on the program. And uh, Downtown Rochester has been really, really active during all of this. There are a lot of new businesses that have come in. You, you've provided a lot of support to the businesses that are st st still there. Talk to us a little bit about the resilience of the business community in Rochester Hills and in surrounding areas because somehow, some way, these businesses have found a way to keep the local economy in, re in Rochester Hills alive despite all the challenges that have faced them during the pandemic. Yeah. Well, we, we, we have some strong numbers. I mean, prior to COVID, we had uh, the second lowest unemployment rate in the state of Michigan, and we hovered there for probably the last three years. Um, so we have a very strong and vibrant business community. And, it, you know, it's times like these, and, and, and this is true for me and, and for others in the community as well. You know, in good times, we always call on our business community for support, whether it's supporting the fireworks or, uh, you know, the, the, the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. And time after time, that local community steps up and, and invest back in, into the community in which they serve. And this has been a really unique time for us to turn around and support them. Um, and so we've run a lot of special programs uh, here to try to support those local businesses. Again, we, we're doing one called Restaurant Bingo, uh, where the city uh, has these bingo cards. And if you if you go to three restaurants, or I think three or four restaurants, um, and save your receipt or take a picture of your receipt, um, and you get a bingo, we're gonna come in, we're gonna give you a, uh, 20 to 30 dollars of gift cards for other local restaurants in the community. It helps us. It helps us get a little cash infusion at the front, and it helps them get a little bit of money on the back end as well. Um, and it's just a unique, a unique program to try and support those small businesses. They have been resilient. They've always been here for us. You know, they've they've you know they've reworked menus, reworked carry out, reworked whole parts of their store to turn more into Grubhub and these other service delivery uh, components. And so again. Uh, we can't do everything, but man, as a municipality, we better be doing everything we possibly can, every tool in our uh, tool chest to make sure uh, we're standing up for the folks that are always there every time we ask them for support. So, Mr. Mayor, one thing we are hearing is still a concern is the possibility of homelessness and evictions. What are you hearing from the people of your community in Rochester Hills and the court system as well? Well, that's a, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, we've been fortunate that that uh, problem has not been pervasive here in our in our city. Um, but I, as the uh, previous uh, past media president of the Conference of Mayors, that was an issue that we dealt with nationally uh, on a very regular basis. And, you know, COVID, something like COVID hits disproportionately uh, to income levels and to communities of color. And so uh, you have to have a plan in place. You have to be able to ask these kinds of questions you have to be able to see and really pivot pretty quickly um you know it's it's you know you can't just say jump on a website and find this for help uh to a community like that you have to go out uh, and find them and, and try to present 
and provide and connect the resources really at municipal life that's that's a lot of what we do is connecting resource with need uh, and that's been a significant issue for my colleagues across the country are you concerned about so many people working remotely now that they may not actually return to the offices and what that could look like for the city of Rochester Hills? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting question. I, mean, I think we'll look back at this era and, and see this as a significant sort of sea change uh, in terms of how we view employment. On one side, um, you know, you have folks going, man, I love the flexibility of working at home. Um, I no longer spend 42 minutes in commute uh, from Rochester Hills to, to Wixom. Uh, and I, you know, it's more time I get to spend with my family. On the other side of that, um, my dry cleaner tells me that his business is down 50% because people aren't wearing sport coats and getting their clothes clean like they usually do. Um, I was just talking to a significant developer who had a, a, an office project that was getting to remove, uh, move forward and said, listen, I, I don't think there's going to be need for office space the way there is currently. Uh, I need to reconfigure this into light industrial and to some other things that we think have a, a higher need. So, you know, there'll be winners and losers uh, in this. I don't think, uh, you know, people working from home is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, one of the things that from my standpoint as an employer of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of people, uh, I want them to have a healthy home life work balance. And if this is helpful for that and we can still accomplish the tasks uh, that we're required to accomplish. I'm not opposed to introducing components of this that might stay more uh, more permanent. Um, but we do have to be mindful of the fact that the that this will change uh, for a lot of folks and a lot of their a lot of their income streams are going to be severely hindered if this is sort of the new normal. Mayor Brian Barnett from the city of Rochester Hills with us on the Oakland County Mega Cash. Just a few more minutes with you, Mr. Mayor. Before we have to let you go today, is there anything else that you'd like to discuss about what's going on in Rochester Hills or any other subject matter that we didn't touch on today? Yeah. Well, listen, we've, we've uh, and by the way, I was born and raised in, uh, in West Bloomfield, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm old school uh, from your neck of the woods. Uh, I, I'm so proud of our community. I just gave a speech to uh, uh, 10 or 12 new employees this morning about all the things that are happening here. Quickly, one that's probably most regionally important, we're building a new park called Innovation Hills. Uh, we just broke ground on a three and a half million dollar playground. It's gonna be the coolest playground in Southeast Michigan. Our park currently has the only glow in the dark sidewalks anywhere uh, in the Midwest. And so it's this really cool place for people to come out, experience nature, get to uh, uh, get out of the, the the rat race for a little bit, enjoy our boardwalks. And so love to invite uh, your uh, uh, your listeners, viewers, and friends to, to come out to Innovation Hills, the city of Rochester Hills, because it's a, it's a really cool, unique place to recreate. And as people are looking to find more things to do, kind of unique events with their kids and family, uh, this one should be on your list. Well, Mayor, we thank you very much for being with us today. Have a great day, and thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. You as well. Mayor Brian Barnett from the city of Rochester Hills with us on the Oakland County Megacast today as, as we have continued to bring the latest news and information from all throughout the community in the in the local area. Just a couple more minutes left in the show, Ronnie. We've had a really nice week over here, a lot of interesting guests to talk with today and, and all throughout the week. And as so much so much of our news is about real people in our communities and the challenges, the variety of challenges that are being faced at multiple levels. Yeah, every day we do this show, Tyler, where I learn something new. As you said, we have so many different guests from the local police to the mayors and to the business leaders as well. And so it's always uh, interesting to see who is going to be on the show next. And one of the things that we are trying to do with this show is to educate you, the public, but also to inform you about what is going on in our backyard. Because I think pre-COVID, we got into a bubble and we just seem to exist in those bubbles. But now that we are spending more time at home and virtually, it allows us to expand our horizons and to see some of these other things that are available within our communities and to reach out and to learn new things and to connect with new people. And that is always a great thing. And uh, we're lucky to be able to do that here on Civic Center TV. We certainly are. So that is going to do it for today's edition of the Oakland County Mega Cash. Just about one minute left in today's program before we will say goodbye. I'd like to give a thank you to the Wild Lake Consolidated School District for joining us today as our Facebook partner and Ken Gutman, their superintendent, 
for joining us today as our first guest. We also are joined and thankful for being joined by Brittany Trout, the recreation programmer at West Bloomfield Parks, Brian Bassett, the chief of police in the city of Sylvan Lake, Michael Salaka from Game Time and the Detroit Renegades, and of course our last guest who was just on a few minutes ago with us, the mayor of Rochester Hills, Brian Barnett. For our entire team, Jake Kustash, our booking producer, and Larry Nyland, our Zoom producer, Ronnie Dahl, my co-host on location with us today in Traverse City, Dave Scott, our executive ma uh, general manager, uh, the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff Birmingham Area Municipal Access. We want to thank you for tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. We will return with new episodes on Monday.